Welcome to the Revelation Companion Podcast. Listen in as we dive deeper into the book of Revelation through special episodes and sermon recaps. Let's join the conversation now. Hey, welcome back to the Revelation Companion Podcast. We have a special guest today, uh, Wayne, a member of our directional leadership team here at True Hope, who we're so pleased to have join us. Uh, This special episode is all about the rapture. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're a nerd and you're looking to nerd out, here you go. This one's for you. Even if you're not a nerd. (laughs) Then this one might blow your mind. So um, (laughs) I'll, I'll say up front, this has the uh, propensity to be a longer podcast. We have yeah. a lot to get through. Um, but a couple of things we want to do. We want to set the stage. So Ryan, I'm going to hand this over to you. I want okay. you to kind of share the objective. What's, what's the goal of this podcast? Yeah. And then we're going to hear from Wayne, a little intro from him, who he is, his background and yep. how he got here. Yeah, so this is the second special episode. We had a f- initial one, uh, through revelation, talking about how to read revelation as a worship guide. And then we've been doing a lot of like, bi-weekly sermon recaps. Um, when we planned to teach through Revelation at True Up Church, we had decided we would need some special episodes. And so this is probably the first one of, of relative debate, admitting that this is a book, Revelation, that's read uh, by faithful Christians in a handful of ways. And so we want to talk in a, hand, in a moment about just some of those views. But our goal with this podcast isn't so much We're not trying to have a Ryan versus Wayne face off. We're not trying to have a post-tribulationism versus pre-tribulationism or any other of the views. We do want to model Christian charity around disagreement, but we don't want that to be a blanket, right? We're not trying to say, don't have a view, don't study, don't be hungry uh, to learn about scripture. Because again, we can, I think, fall prey to a couple ditches here. One of them is we could say, Well, because very well-intended, intelligent people don't see this eye to eye, we shouldn't care. And I think that's a little bit of a miss because, Wayne, you and I have talked about this, but, you know, this book at the beginning in chapter one, we receive explicit promise that the ones who read the words of the prophecy of this book receive blessings. It's the only book that does that. Yeah. So like we have a library of books we call the Bible, but we have this final book that uh, seems to offer us strong incentive and encouragement to read it. Um, Now, there are different ways to read it. The church has read it differently historically. So we're going to try to highlight some of that. But our goal is to model, we're in the same church. We serve on on the elder board of the church. And we have similar views, but slightly different views. And this subject of the rapture, will help elucidate that slight difference. And so what I do want, um, and I thank you for coming on, Wayne. Like, you are in no way a um, someone who doesn't know the scripture, love eschatology, and have a strong conviction on how you read and see these texts. And I'm, I'm appreciative of that. We've talked a lot yeah. uh, at board meetings, kind of in passing. In fact, I just want to start with this. Wayne is actually the reason why uh, about man, it's probably seven years ago now, I taught a series on the end times at True Hope. We had discussed and you were like, why don't you ever teach on the end times? And I'm like, well, I tell you what, Wayne, that is (laughs) just a contentious, complicated subject. And, you know, but you helped encourage me like, but it's really important. Don't you think? Yes, I do. Isn't the the return of Christ so critical? Yes, it is. So I did a series. You might remember this. It was called It's the End of the World as We Know It. it. And I did five sermons topically just on what happens when we die what does the afterlife look like what happens when jesus returns what are the different views um you know and so i went through it in in a more thematic manner and i think that helped me quite frankly garner the courage in the last a couple of years to be willing to bite off revelation because um it is it is a daunting task uh, from an interpretive standpoint so that's our goal our goal is to show the views encourage christian study Help people realize that at True Up Church, I talk to a gentleman on Sunday that doesn't hold my view or your view. There, that's fine. We believe the Bible is inspired. We believe Jesus is Lord. He's coming again. But we want to talk about it because we don't want to merely relegate this to the, well, who cares? I think it's worth the discussion and the friendly debate. Yes. Yes. Thoughts on that? Well, for sure. Because when you look at it, all the prophecy in the Bible and you add up those verses, prophecy is really... Like a third, a third yeah. of all of Scripture. So if you're going to, you know, not all of it is on the end times. Yep. But we can't just ignore prophecy. And and the the, uh, the 
the period of time we're about to dive into is the most documented mm. period in all of Scripture. This seven-year period of time, the, that we call it the Great Tribulation, has more prophecy about that, probably twice as much as mm. even Christ's first coming. Mm. Right, so like, I think you're right in that we can't just ignore this stuff. We, you know, yeah. admittedly, we won't understand it all. Yeah, and, and I'm the first to admit I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, as we were talking <laughs> earlier. There's people way smarter Pretty than I sharp am knife, though. on this. Yeah. On that, well, looks aren't everything. Right? <laughs> so, uh, but in, you know, on each of these views, there's very, very intelligent, wonderful Christians, yeah. you know, that have a, scholars, scholars, yeah. like, mm-hmm. a different view on this stuff, yeah. and so. I think I think God reveals things in its time, mm-hmm. and so what we need to do is be aware of what these views are, and and uh, and what might be coming, and and things like that. To be to be aware of these things, the signs, you know, sure. of the times, and all that. Jesus gives us a list of them. Yep. <clears throat> so that when these things start happening, we can be like the you know the the this group in the in the in the book of Acts called the the Bereans, right? Mm. They were really a cool group in that they were hearing all of this new kind of stuff and they would go back to the scriptures and search it to see if it is yeah. so. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think we kind of need to have that attitude here. Yep. So that when we hear these these things in the different views, we can go back on our own because you know I don't want people to just take my word for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know you need to go back and do your own research on this stuff and, yep. and, uh, and see if it is so. Yep. You like the Berean. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Let's do this. So I'm going to share. I'll kind of share. We have some notes here. What is the rapture? So this is a special episode on the rapture. So I'm going to kind of work through this statement. And I want you to like either color commentate or just go, yep, got it, got it. And I think yep. this will lead us up to the point of clarifying for, for our discussion and also for the audience tuning in kind of what the rapture is. And then we'll kind of give some... 30,000 foot views on hermeneutics, models of interpretation for the end times, right. which we're going to give people a warning that there's more to come in the future episodes to help back fill some of this. For the serious uh, eschatology student, they're ready. For the person that's newer to this, they're interested and they're going to need more. So we'll kind of work through that. And then after that, Wayne, once we get through kind of that high level, you're going to share your story, yeah. kind of how you arrive at your position, and then kind of give your view. We're going to give you the floor for a while. And then um, I'll kind of share my journey and story, and then we'll kind of hone in on the couple biblical texts that we think is the crucial place of decisioning from an interpretive model for why people land where they land on this subject. Yeah. If, if I can interrupt you real quick, yes, one sir. thing I want to do that's really fun is what I love about Wayne is he's he's he is on our um, board, yep. but he's also just a church goer, just like me, right? Yep. And so we got kind of the professional pastor. Oh, oh there it is. Like, I don't know. Like, like the, <laughs> too much pressure. Right? So you're on the one side of the table, and but I want Wayne uh, just give a little snapshot. When you're not studying eschatology, who are you? What do you do? Uh, tell us about yourself. Okay, so. Well, like my story, we're going to yeah, get to that. He's going to get to the story. Oh, yeah, yeah. we're getting into the meat. Yeah, so I mean, I want to get to the rapture subject first, yeah. and then we'll get I to the I was going story. for the appetizer. I'm you were. sorry. I know. I'm sorry. That's we got to hold you back. Okay. So we're going to talk about the rapture, and then Wayne will introduce kind of Love himself. It. Great. So, so the word rapture, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading, does not occur in the Bible. However, in the Latin Vulgate, rapture is present. Now, this the underlying word of it's rapio. Yes, rapiro, I think, uh, is the pronunciation. Which is snatching away. Yes. This idea of a carrying off, a snatching away, is a biblical concept. And this is where you and I agree. We both agree that the scripture, namely 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54, are referring to what we both are comfortable calling the rapture, which is this catching up of the alive saints, the church, uh, translating them instantaneously, miraculously into um, immortal bodies fit for the kingdom come. That is what the rapture is. So we both affirm the doctrine of the rapture is present in the New Testament. It is not present in the Old Testament, but that doesn't bother us. It's a mystery. mystery. And Paul says that. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 that... This is a mystery now revealed. We will all die, or excuse me, we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And so uh, the rapture then, um, that word itself, much much like I would describe this like like the word Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but but the Trinity is self-evident 
in the Bible, the co-equal persons of Father, Son, and Spirit operating in relationship as the eternal Godhead are absolutely unmistakable. And I would agree, uh, um, though not as much, I mean, the, 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 the Trinitarian function of the Godhead is has even more, I think, biblical ammo than the rapture. But there's enough New Testament scriptural citation for what I would call and you would call the rapture, that you and I are in the position that we think the rapture of the church is a glorious event we should all long for, uh, is in this event we are finally free from the presence of sin, we are translated into the presence of God with bodies fit for eternity, and um, yeah, the big debate is not if there's a rapture between you and me, the debate or difference of interpretation is the timing and scope of that. And so one of our uh, well, our main objective in this podcast is to kind of like flesh out um, chronology and potential timing, not like it's happening in 2027. Because we agree. Date setters. We're not date right. setting. Yes. That is foolish. Yep. The church is filled with that error. We are not doing that. We have no desire to do that. But on a big picture level, we are trying to say, here's the sweep of prophetic implication of these promises and how our interpretive schools see them playing out as far as order of events. Yeah, okay? that's fair. That's so fair. give us the top give us the, the top views here that would help set the stage. <clears throat> and there's a graphic people will see on the screen. Yeah, so so when you get into a study like Ryan said of, of Revelation, the, the first thing you're gonna run into is how is this to be taken and and specifically uh, revelation 20 the the thousand year millennial reign mm -hmm. so you're gonna have to decide is is does jesus come back before this or is it even a literal right. thousand year uh, right. millennial reign and so the pre-mill view would would hold that it is a literal 1000 years and i think uh, like you said we both hold to that view and uh, uh and there is a tribulation period ahead of that yeah Right, and so that's the uh, the pre-mill view. I think on that chart you'll see the hermeneutic on the bottom. If yep. you tend to be a little more literal in how you want to read uh, scripture, you'll end up on the right side of this chart. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, if you're willing to allegorize, and that would be when you're in general reading read scripture, you'll end up more on the left side of this chart than the amillennial view, mm -hmm. which says there there isn't a literal one thousand year. Tribulation, right? Yeah. And there's not a literal um, uh, tribulation. There's not a literal yep. millennium or a literal, yep. and and uh, th that we're already in it. Mm -hmm. It started at the cross and, mm -hmm. and and all of that kind of thing. So in the middle there, you'll see post millennial, and that one is probably the least popular. I would say. presently, presently, yeah. It's having a resurgence though. Yeah, that that's a view where through the preaching of the gospel, you know, all of this. Uh, Tribulation still happened in 70 AD when, right. when Jerusalem was destroyed. Yep. So through the preaching of the gospel since that time, the, the earth is going to get better and better and more Christianized, so to speak, and over a long period of time. And then Jesus will come back yep. after that millennial and then a new heaven and a new earth at that time. And yeah. that's it. So that's that's the overall view. There's yeah. some different offshoots to that, I would mm -hmm. think, but this is probably primarily... And just to kind of like uh, uh, give people a teaser, we are uh, hoping to be able to get Wayne to come back towards the end of this to talk more about millennial, millennial views. And the millennium will be discussed when we teach through this in the book at the end. It's really like in like June. Uh, but the reason why we're starting here is these schools of thought frame the foundation here when we move to the, the rapture conversation because all millennialism believes the millennium, which is referenced in Revelation 20, which literally means that word millennium is a thousand years. Yeah. And a, an amillennialist is going to use an allegorical interpretation of that, that that doesn't have to be a literal 1,000 years, right. but that it's now, that we're living in the millennium now, that Christ's first advent and death and resurrection launched his reign. That's that's that view, which neither one of us hold, but there are people uh, at Shrove Church, friends that I know that hold this view, and they also think that the tribulation then is now, and that both of these things are kind of running together. They do, I do know millennial, all millennials who think there'll be an intensification towards the end because they do believe sure. in an antichrist that will be revealed and all of that. But the point is the millennium and where it is in the nature of it sets the, the frame of that view. And then yeah, post mill, Christianize the world, millennium, then Christ returns. The big area here where we totally agree, premillennialism tends to think, not tends, it thinks, Christ launched the kingdom spiritually, but there is a physical fulfillment of that that has not happened yet. And the church 
is operating in this world uh, in a, such a way where the gospel is being preached, but the world's going to get darker and darker and darker until Christ returns. Right. Yeah. And, and we both hold that view. Now, you'll see on the chart underneath that, you have this second layer of words. Right. They're not out of the woods yet. Just no, because if, you're a, pre happened, if you're a premillennial, which both of us are, and yes. I suppose we can just add some, some terms to this, you uh, hold a dispensational premillennial view, and I hold a historic or classical premillennial view, and that's where Wayne and I differ. And one of the key areas of difference on that, there's a few, but one of them that's major is the topic of this podcast, and it's the rapture. Right. It's the, 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 the timing of that and when that event we think will take place. And so you'll see on the bottom there, post-tribulational, which is the view I am most persuaded by. And let me just also say this. I have said this before. I am not 100% convinced on anything in this. That doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I don't, I'm don't. i not willing to discuss, but I'm not 100% convinced of my view. But I would lean uh, post-tribulational, which what that means is, is I think the rapture is going to happen as a part of the second coming of Christ. Now, if you're a mid-tribulational person, you think it happens in the middle of this tribulation and if you're a pre-tribulational view which is yours you see the rapture as happening before the traditional seven-year tribulation time yes correct yes yeah well said so that is kind of an overview so the reason why i want to give that and hopefully that image is helpful is to know you could be listening to this podcast and you're an all-millennial you're um as it relates to the conversation of rapture you're going to probably lean more my direction because our views sync up easier because we both think the second coming and that thing called the rapture happen at the same time if you're a you're a post-millennial probably as well so really interestingly the amillennialists and the post-millennialists tend to be more easily listening to someone of my view because their view is already synced up because they've eliminated the idea of needing a millennium after the return of Christ. And so what that creates is really the premillennialist breaks out into two spots, a classic historic view, which is post-trib, or a pre- and mid-tribulationalist, which see that rapture as being a separate secret return or... Separate event. Separate event. And so that's kind of sets the stage for what we want to discuss. So let's now... Sean, any questions? Like how you're viewing this, what you're thinking? No. Are you following? I just want to be empathetic to anybody whose brain is just like <laughs> already tired. Do you like, remember it's last okay. uh, it was in November. December or November? My I house. came over to your house and I tried to write all this on a board oh, yeah. on the wall for Sean yeah, and for another. For, yeah. Oh, wow. And there was a lot of. Yeah, yeah. So I do. And Wayne and I talked about this ahead of time. It's why we mm -hmm. want to give this. I want people to know we're going to return to these subjects in yeah. future podcasts. As we now pivot into the portion of Revelation, chapters four and five are kind of a, they're not so much end times y, but six through 18 mm -hmm. is really gonna get there. And then 19 through 22, we're really gonna get yeah. there, where we're really gonna start to, to, to delve into these important events the Bible describes. And we have to make interpretive decisions on what's happening here and what they mean and what that in infers. Yeah. If you don't understand, we're opening up your office hours. Is that correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> Stop for, by any. For one-on-ones? -on <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's why we have Wayne here. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wayne is going to meet with Wayne's everyone in the church. personal dress. <laughs> every, yeah, here's I'm your retired dress. now, so what else I got to do? <laughs> Wayne's ready to go. I love it. I love yeah, it. Wayne has actually <laughs> gone to a few community groups and shared views on, on well, end Well, I, I offered, yes. Yeah, yeah, your own, in your yeah. own community group. Yes, we did. You're discussing this, and I think it's one of your kids as well, and... Yep. And that's great. And I and again, just to rehash this, we at True Hope Church want to have an open hand of view on this. Yeah. The the ditches, the error would be Jesus already returned, or Jesus isn't returning. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Everything in between, yeah. it's okay. We can have a discussion on and we can mm -hmm. agree to disagree. So Wayne, tell us your story. Yes. Tell us kind of like about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, some people know you, but a lot of people watching this probably don't. Well, so give us the yeah. the full deal on you and your end times journey. Okay, uh, so first of all, thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, this this is kind of an honor for me to be here. Uh, We're honored to have you. For sure. Well, thank you. So so my story, I was I was raised on a farm in the middle of North Dakota, a small town, and and there were two churches in town. One was Lutheran and one was Catholic. And so we were members of the, uh, the Lutheran church, and the topic of eschatology came up zero times from what I can remember all through my my younger years all the way through high school basically you know we we were we learned that jesus is coming yeah right? no one knows when you just got to be ready so but um the topic of eschatology and this study never came up 
And so then I went to uh, two different Lutheran schools. One was the Lutheran Bible Institute uh, for different reasons I went there. And, and then I finished up at Concordia University in, in business. So, so uh, at LBI, though, um, <clears throat> I was in my early 20s, and I remember taking a class on Revelation, you know, and, and really seeing for the first time that there's, you know, uh, a, a deeper view of, of uh the amillennial view, which is the Lutheran view, mm-hmm. which is what was taught there. And they really didn't teach any other views. It was just, this is this is what it is. And I remember the professor kind of saying one time, you know, there's there's other views, but those guys are kind of out in left. <laughs> you know, really. It's pretty much what everybody says. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I get it. There's, there's the Lutheran school and, and all of that. So so my my background is amillennial. Yep. And, I, and I've studied it at, at the LBI. And, and then uh, I would say, say 20, 25 years ago, maybe reading through scripture again, just uh, kind of perusing through it and, and, uh, and thinking intentionally that when I get to revelation this time, I'm going to spend a little more time. Mm -hmm. And and I did that and kind of dug in a little bit more. I went, you know, I got out my old notes from college and and all of that and read a couple of books on the different views, the pre-mail being one of them and, and, uh, and just kind of learning what, what the other views are. And the whole idea of uh, taking a more little, literal approach to Scripture is really what I want to do. I try to have a, a biblical worldview just on politics and, and all of that. I think you know God is involved in, in our world. And, and does he give us instruction on all these different areas? And Ryan, you've done a great job of, of preaching that. Mm-hmm. You know, God does want us involved in mm-hmm. all these different areas. And let's go to scripture and see if it gives us guidance. So I like the idea of that uh, uh, more literal view. And I, and I found, you know, I'm 65 now, and, and the, the older that I get and the, and the more study I've done, the more literal I become. I'm, I'm, whenever I read through a passage that, that requires some sort of interpretation, and, and some do, and, and, and some is very obvious. Like, Scripture does that, right? Mm-hmm. And the figures of speech. You know, Jesus said, I'm the door, yeah. right? Well, we know that he's not a hunk of wood. You yeah. know, or, yeah. or, or you're the salt of the earth, right? That, that doesn't mean you're going to ionize, right, when you get wet. <laughs> okay, so those are figures of speech. And, and Jesus uses also parables and, and things like that that, you know, yep. need a little interpretation. And oftentimes, those are interpreted for us. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to do the work of interpreting it. So, so when I when I read a passage that might require some interpretation, then I'm going to be as literal as, as I can be, and you know we've talked about that. And some of these revelation passages get tricky. They do. With, can I ask you a question? Yep. And I don't. And I it's still your still your pot, spot here, but I just want to get back and yep. forth. Why do you think that? As you you said, the older I get, the more literal I get. What is what is like dig underneath that a little bit? What does that mean? Is it just meaning? Uh, the older I get, the more I want to make sure Scripture is defining my like. What's motivating that, or what? Just tell me more. Well, I guess un- unless Scripture gives me a reason not to, I'm going to take it literally. You know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb a little bit here now. Then, since you wanted me to, <laughs> when we just finished up in Genesis, right? Yep. Yep. And so, so talking about Noah and the flood. Yep. I've read some uh, some scholars, yep. you know, that would say, well, you know, maybe it's not a region, a worldwide flood. It might be just regional, you yep. know, and all these reasons yep. why that. Yep. And I just, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why? Why can't we just believe what it says? Mm-hmm. You know, it says it's a world flood. I'm going with a world flood. Mm-hmm. So, so what I mean by that, is if I'm going to err in my reading of Scripture, I'm going to err on the side of being too literal. I mean, other than you know saying, well, maybe it wasn't. It might have been a regional flood in, sure. in that example. Sure. So I might get to heaven and Jesus says, you know, what were you thinking? <laughs> you, know, I, maybe, I, I, you know, I don't know. But if I'm going to err, I'm going yeah. to be on that side. You and I talked about this when we were preparing, preparing for this, and this is probably an area where. I don't think at a, at a heart level you and I disagree, but I think that for whatever reason, my approach in this area is, I hesitate to say different, but it might be different. I, I feel like my my approach to hermeneutics wouldn't be, I'm not going to err on the side of literalism as an operating system in scripture. I want to try to 
recognize that the goal of interpretation, which every text has to be interpreted, is I want to I want to be on the side of the author's intent. Mm. So if the author intends that to be literal, well, that's absolutely where we got to go. And the part that's hard to me about prophecy, both in Daniel, which we'll look at here, and we'll also look at Revelation to discuss with the rapture, is this is a apocalyptic yeah. genre type that we 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 readily admit utilizes imagery and symbols and illustrations of things that aren't literally the things, but they are representing the things that are literal. Right. And so that's where so that's where I think you and I have wrestled wonderfully together over passages of scripture sure. where I'm kind of like, well, I don't know that that needs to be forced into that literal reading because I, and I don't think what I don't want people to hear with that is I'm against the literal truth. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I just think that the, the, no, the, the that. question is we have to make an interpretive decision and we're at, we're both after the authorial intent. That's proper hermeneutics. But I think I'm just curious for you why, whether life experience or you feel like the culture or, or liberalism in Christianity has erred by tending to too I often yeah, symbolize. Let me, let me make a comment on that. Okay. Too, Cause growing up in the Lutheran church, uh, it's the church I loved, Yeah, totally. you know, and, and, and I've seen a lot of compromise yep. in the Lutheran mm -hmm. church. Yeah. And I'm sure you guys have too, in the denominational churches, mm -hmm. so to speak, where, where we're ordaining people in a, in a different yep. lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. And in an active lifestyle yep. and, and we're, we're compromising there. And, and so I think when I get back to that allegorical view, I think if you can allegorize and say, yeah, I know that's what scripture says, but yeah. that's not what it means. Totally. You can take that yeah. to even the time of Genesis and, yep. and yep. the flood or even like Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. and say it, it, it says that, but it doesn't mean that for now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. And it, and and that's it, what I and was, it hurts when I see that in the, the church that I've loved mm, all these years. That's what I figured. I think because I, I think what's hard about this question is like, you know, we'll show, I think, there are elements of reading prophetic literature where the writer and conveyor of the vision or the dream tells us yeah. it's allegorical. So this is... A, a, a style of writing and communicating that is, it's why there's so much debate. Like how many, the fact that we have this much difference in the church historic over these subjects illustrates this is a tough section of scripture sure. to, to, to work through. So continue with your story. Okay, so let me, let me explain then the, how I switched them from millennial to pre -mail. Yep. Okay. And really it came for me, a couple of passages in Scripture, one starting the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy, mm. just an, an astounding prophecy, four verses is all. So I'd like to give us a high-level yeah, view of that. Please. So I think in order to truly understand Revelation and the purpose of the tribulation that's described in Revelation, you have to have a pretty good handle on um, the 70 weeks that's described in, in uh, Daniel 9. So so let's let's go there. Um, <clears throat> Daniel 9, 24? Yeah. Yeah. And so while you're getting there, and, and if you're just uh, um, listening to this, you could get your Bible out. I'm in the uh, New King James Version. I like that one when reading through Revelation and such. But just a little background here in, in Daniel 9. I mean, Daniel's in captivity, right? They're, they're all, and it's been about 70 years. And, and he's basically in his room reading his Bible, right? And so he's reading in the, uh, uh, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25 specifically, dealing hmm. with the uh, the 70 years, you know, he's reading, Jeremiah's prophesying to Israel, you know, thus saith the Lord, you know, because you haven't repented of your ways and taken after false gods and all that, I'm going to, I'm going to grab that king of Babylon and bring his armies and, and we're, you're going into captivity for 70 years, right? And so that's the prophecy that Daniel was reading mm -hmm. and he's, and he's sitting there, he's doing the math in his head. You can just kind of see that in the, in the text thinking, we are there. This <laughs> 70 years is up. And so, so to me, that's an example. How, how does Daniel handle prophecy? Mm -hmm. he, he took that 70 years literally. He didn't allegorize and say it's just a long period of time or, or say, you know, prophecy is just going to unfold. I don't, there's nothing I need to do, really. That's not how he handled this. So the first thing he does is goes into prayer. Mm -hmm. and it's really quite, uh, uh, quite a prayer. I mean... Uh, it's most of the uh, chapter nine. Mm -hmm. and, and then what happens during this prayer, he gets interrupted. Hmm. This is often called the interrupted prayer. And so, so Gabriel 
the angel just shows up mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and says to Daniel, the, uh, the moment you started praying, word, word came from, from, uh, from heaven or from God for me to deliver this message to you. <laughs> the moment you started praying. Mm -hmm. that, so if he hadn't started praying, would God have worked it out? Yeah, probably. You know, but, but he, to me, it tells us God wants us involved. Mm -hmm. you know, should we be praying for Jesus second, you know, for the uh, rapture and all that? Probably. Mm -hmm. God, does God need us? Probably not. Mm -hmm. He wants us. But we're his creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, that's just how he rolls. He wants us involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so, so Daniel uh, is, is listening to, to, to Gabriel do this. And Gabriel says, uh, starting in uh, verse 24, so let's just read the text. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. So again, this is a study all on its own. But this 70 weeks is, uh, a week is seven years for our purpose. So 70 times 7 would be 490 years, hmm. right? So not literal. 70 weeks, yes. Right. be literally... <laughs> I'm just messing with you. You are messing with me, dude. I'm, I'm nervous <laughs> enough here. <laughs> so 70 weeks are determined. So 490 years are determined for your people and your holy city. So who would your people be, would you say? Daniel's people are the yeah, Jews, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And your holy city would be Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So so Gabriel's making it pretty clear that this, uh, this prophecy is specifically for Israel, and uh, Jerusalem. Yep. Okay, then he goes on in that first verse, uh, verse 24, but it's the first verse of the prophecy, for the scope of this period of time. What has to happen here? So he goes on, we need to finish the transgressions and to make an end of sins. So, so the Jews here did not accept Jesus as their Messiah, that mm -hmm. we had a, in 490 years. And this, this goes from the time of Daniel all the way to Jesus' second coming. So it's a, it's a long period of time, but you have to know that this clock stops on that. There's an interval that we're going to come up to. So we have to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. The end of sins <clears throat> hasn't happened yet, but to make reconciliation for iniquity, you could argue that that happened at the cross, right? Mm -hmm. to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So all these things have to happen in these uh, 490 years. So uh, in the second verse, this is dealing with 69 weeks hmm. of the 70. Mm -hmm. So let's read here in 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, which that is Jesus, Messiah the, the King, that's the day that he... Walking into, behold, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a big day uh, for Israel. So from the, from the uh, command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. We're not going to get into why the division, but just know that it's 69 weeks for our purposes here. Right? And the street shall be uh, built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. So... 69 weeks, my view would hold that that precision in, uh, that Gabriel gives to uh, Daniel is astounding hmm. to the day Jesus comes in on uh, that triumphal entry to the day from uh, the day they were first given the permission to rebuild the city until uh, Jesus comes into town riding on that donkey. We've all read that passage a number of times. Hmm. Right? <clears throat> okay, so then uh, the third verse after these 62 weeks, which is actually 69, because we have a seven week mentioned before the 62, right? So after the 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. He has to die, hmm. but not for himself, right? So who does he die for? If not for himself. Mm -hmm. for, for you and me, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, and then uh, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. So when Messiah here is cut off, that's when this clock stops on the 70 weeks. You have to think of it like, like a ball game. For example, you know, you got four quarters that are 15 minutes each, right? Mm -hmm. So we know game time is actually an hour. But how long does that game really take? Yeah, three hours. Probably two months. Yeah, two, at least two hours or, or more. Mm -hmm. So which is right? Is it 60 minutes or is it two hours? Well, they both are, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, so what's happened here is, is the, the clock has stopped on the, uh, 
on this on the 70 weeks because we know that this fourth verse coming up is yet future this fourth verse is jesus himself um quotes here when he's talking in matthew 24 to the uh disciples who say you know what what's going to be the the sign of your coming and of the end of the age and, and those questions he quotes daniel the prophet in this uh, daniel 9 prophecy so the fourth verse here uh says then he meaning the antichrist shall con confirm a covenant with many for one week so for seven years that's where we get the uh the, the 70th week the seven year time period for the tribulation but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and to offering. So we know that in Israel there has to be a temple because there isn't one right now and there isn't sacrifice going on, the animal sacrifices. So, so the Antichrist is going to stop into the, uh, the temple and he's going to put a stop to that. And then to finish the, uh, the verse, it says, And on the wing of abominations shall one uh, who makes desolate even until a consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate or the desolator. So that's kind of describing what, what happens in that 70th week, which is the, uh, the seven year tribulation. So what's important is to understand the purpose of the tribulation. God, God gives it to us right here. He's got to work with Israel and he's going to drive Israel to her knees during mm. this uh, seven year tribulation to finish the transgression, to make an end of their sins, where they didn't recognize Jesus as their Messiah. That was a big deal, hmm. right? And so uh, this interval, the, th the third verse, we want to talk about that just a little bit too. So Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. So I want to take us to that passage where Jesus is entering into Jerusalem on a donkey, right? So that's the, uh, let's go to Luke 19. And and it's uh, verse uh, 4. 41, where I want to start, but I'll, but I'll give you a little background here too. This is Jesus, you know, has been uh, in, in his ministry for quite some time, and, and he's he's picked this day because he knows this is the day he's got to come into town. And the crowds are saying, he blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And 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 he tells the disciples, you know, you got to go down into town and get this donkey because I gotta I gotta ride into town on this thing, right? And that fulfills. A, uh, a prophecy. I forget the. Is that Zechariah? Oh, I'm never. But it, it is an uh, Old Testament prophet. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's prophesied, and Jesus has to fulfill that. Not allegorically. He's not going to walk into town with a humble spirit, as if one riding on a donkey. Right. He tells the disciple, "You got to go get that thing. I got to ride into town <laughs> to literally fulfill this prophecy." So while he's waiting, we get to this passage in 41, and I tell you, this is one of the most chilling passages I think in all of Scripture. Because this is where Jesus is looking out over the whole city and he's weeping over it and saying in vor and, uh, verse 42, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, if you had only known. And he says, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Hmm. So Jesus here is pronouncing judgment on Israel, on, on the Jews. This partial blindness is, is this judgment that Jesus is, is putting on to uh, Jews right now. And, and that won't be for forever. And we'll get to uh, that here in just a minute. So, and in verse 43, he's uh, talking about the upcoming uh, 70 AD. It says, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Now get this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Right? Mm -hmm. This was a big day for the, for, uh, for the Jews. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus entering town as their Messiah and King, and they were shouting, you know, we want Caesar, we want Caesar. And, Interestingly, you know, all a that time stuff. we celebrate this next coming weekend. Yes, it's coming right Palm up. Sunday. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and four days later, here from this bad, that's, that's when the crucifixion happens. Mm -hmm. So we have this partial blindness that, that's on the Jews. So, and, and this interval that's still paused. So now what, what else is going on during this interval? That, that, this is a, a key thing. So Paul, in Ephesians 3, he tells us that it's his privilege to introduce the mystery of the church. So, so the church is going to be built 
during this interval. Jesus is adding to the church daily. It starts at Pentecost, right? And, and it's still going on today. So this 490-year prophecy, we're, we're still in this interval, right? And so how long is this interval going to last? Well, fortunately, Scripture tells us, right? How long? <laughs> well, Paul, again, in, in uh, uh, Romans 11, right? Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in? Yes. Well done. <laughs> Dude, yeah. you're, you're up on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about it before. He, yeah, he, <laughs> Ryan knows this. So, but, but anyway, the, uh, uh, this partial hardening of, of, or par, partial blindness, rather, of the, of the Jews is going to come to a close. After that last person gives their life to Jesus, that church age or dispensation is going to come to a close. Hmm. And that's when I believe um, that uh, verse in uh, Thessalonians 4.16 that you mentioned, the rapture mm -hmm. verse, mm -hmm. I believe that's when that happens. God the Father will tell Jesus, his son, church age is closed. Go get him. Go get your bride. Mm-hmm. And uh, to read that verse, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And that, that verse, like you said, uh, in, in the Greek is harpazio, yeah. snatched. Yeah. You know? yeah. And in, in Latin, it's rapimur. Ra ra I think that's closer okay. than what I said earlier. Okay. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's this interval, and that's mm -hmm. when this period of time will, will come to a close. So keep in mind, it's, it, it's interesting that the, uh, the groups of the saints that's described uh, in, in Scripture, you know, we have the, the Old Testament saints. You know, people are saved in the Old Testament, right? But they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in uh, Matthew 11 and 11, he said, remember that, that passage uh, talking about John the Baptist, how great he was, but he was in considered least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John. Mm. What's up with that? So this whole church thing, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's a different group than the Old Testament saints. And it's a different group, I believe, that will be in the tribulation. Where we the, differ? Because the church is going to be gone and, and God will once again be dealing with Jews and Gentiles. Mm. You know, all through the New Testament, we're talking about Three people groups, too. We got Jews, Gentiles, and the church, where Paul says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. <laughs> it, it's, it's the church. So once the church has been removed, God will be dealing with uh, Jews and Gentiles once again in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And from what I've been able to find and search, there is no reason in all of Scripture to be given for why the church needs to be in the tribulation. We're, we're given... A lot of reason here in this Daniel passage why Israel has to be there, right? All those reasons lifted up, list, listed off in the, in the first verse of that uh, passage. Put an end to transgression, end to sins, and, and all that stuff. God will be dealing with Israel without, without question. There's no verse that says the church has to be there. There are some hints to say the church will not be there, right? And one of them is that uh, uh, verse in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, you're not destined for wrath, mm -hmm. right? And so, so I want to talk about that just a little bit too. Okay. So, so Jesus and, and Paul tell, telling the church, you're going to have trials and tribulations, right? Mm -hmm. All throughout the last 2,000 years, and some of them have been horrific. Yeah. I can't imagine being oh, yeah. burned at the stake. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I can't even imagine. Hey, COVID looked like a cupcake walk. Yes, but but trials and tribulations all throughout uh, yeah. uh, these last two thousand years. Who's the source of that trials and tribulations? Would you say Satan? For sure, Satan. Now, when we get into Revelation, talking about the seal judgments and the trumpets and the bold judgments, who is the source of that? For certain, in my opinion, the trumpet and the bowls, God. God Himself. Yeah. yeah. The seals. Without question. In, in my view, yeah, it's God. It's a whole different level than the trials and tribulations. You know, it's Hollywood has done us a great disservice, right? You know, they come out with these movies that are really exciting and fun. You know, good versus evil, and G Satan versus Jesus, right? And all that, that is just bad theology, mm. really 
horrible theology mm -hmm. because Scripture gives us three archangels, right? We get Gabriel, Michael, and then this guy named Lucifer who mm. had a problem with pride, mm. right? But, but Jesus is God, you know? He was there since the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the yeah. beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and nothing was made without Jesus, you know, that, that whole deal. So these trials and tribulations are nothing compared to the great tribulation. And so I think that helps us to understand that Thessalonians verse 5.9, that you're not destined for wrath. That wrath is what uh, he's talking about here, that wrath of God. And I affirm that. Yeah. Even while we differ, I affirm that. There's no question the Christian... Those in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, they are not destined to the wrath of God. Even the, uh, I, I, we just went through the seven letters. I think I think there's some uh, information in there that, that is relevant here too, because hmm. we have uh, 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 those two churches, uh, Thyatira uh, was, was given a, you know, it's a church that didn't have anything good said about it, mm -hmm. right? And Jesus specifically said, if you don't repent... I will send you into great tribulation. Mm -hmm. Now, I would take that to mean the great tribulation that that church will enter. Now, Philadelphia, on the other hand, they didn't have anything bad to say about that church. And Jesus went out of his way to say to that church, just hang in there, guys. I'll keep you from the hour of I trial. I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come over the whole world. Yeah. What else could that mean, in, in my view? Now, you don't have to answer that right now, Ryan. I know you're chomping at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> we actually ran out of time. No, just <laughs> and but, you know, done. <laughs> so, so there's all these little yeah. indicators all throughout Scripture why the church will not be there. And so when I'm when I'm reading through this, trying to take you know as little as I can, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, it kind of makes sense to me that the uh, the church will not be there. Now I got one more, and this is then I'll be done. Th this is the most compelling. Was this your clincher? So just real quick before you get into what was it 20 years ago taught all millennialism? Was it just reading other sources, realizing a more literal hermeneutic was optional or possible or preferred? And then really, was it Daniel 9? What was the what was the what was the the linchpin moment that you went, I'm no longer all mill, I'm pre mill, and I'm also okay. pre tribulational? Gotcha. Or did it happen over time? Well, <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it works. But I, I would say that you know, and we just had this conversation about Israel. Yeah. Right. So, so reading through that and looking around, the 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 amillennial view. I mean, they think Israel basically has been replaced. Yeah, it's over by the by mm -hmm. the church, right? But what happened in 1948? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we have an Israel. Yeah. And it's like when you read that account of how that happened, Harry Truman and all these guys, it was like overnight. It, it's 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 kind of crazy how nothing short of God's hand involved, right? Hmm. So now we have Israel. So I've heard some say, well, it's just national Israel and it's a coincidence that they're probably going to end up blowing themselves up anyway. All hmm. that. I don't think so. When, when you look at all of, uh, you know, Revelation and... and uh, that passage we just covered in, in Daniel, God has a purpose for Israel aside from the church. Romans 9, 10, and 11 says, we've been grafted in now, and because of their, their hardness of heart, we, the church, get to benefit from all these blessings of Israel. But Paul says, how much more once, once that hardness and that blindness is removed? Will the world be blessed through Israel? You know, So I think God has a special place for Israel. So, so to answer your question on that, I think reading it more literally or, or trying to to mm -hmm. the best that I can and actually seeing we have an Israel now. So, yeah, okay. That's significant. That was a big deal for yeah, you. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And yeah. all these other prophecies that we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, I think that was a fulfillment of prophecy for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing more. You know, the Jews being regathered into the land from the four corners of the earth. That's never happened before and mm -hmm. that's prophesied in, you know, uh, Jeremiah 29. Mm -hmm. Israel's been regathered twice. Mm -hmm. But, but first was from, uh, from Egypt in Moses' time and then from Babylon in Daniel's time. But now we're seeing that regathering right in front of our eyes yeah. if we're paying attention. Yeah. Right? And, so, and there's other prophecies that are, that are kind of the Jews being hated among mm -hmm. the nations mm -hmm. in Zechariah 12.3. Do we see that on our news now? Are mm -hmm. the Jews being hated? It's that's, shocking that's, to that's me happening. How, hmm. how this is happening after yeah. all of what we think we would have learned in the Holocaust. Yeah. 
But I got, you know, Israel, after the Holocaust, they said, is never again, right? It's going to happen. I got some bad news for him. Zachariah says two out of every three Jews will be killed in the tribulation. Where in the Holocaust, only one out of three died. I mean, it's a crazy thing. Huh. So anyway, th hopefully that answered your question. This, okay. this one thing, and then I'll be done. So, and again, this is, I think, a very compelling reason. And we're going to be getting into this in uh, the sermon series coming up. Yep. So... Uh, I'll, I'll give you all my notes on that, Ryan, when, when you get there. <laughs> so, uh, Boom. <laughs> shots fired. So coming up to uh, Revelation 4 and 5, the, the throne room of God. It's this mm -hmm. wild imagery of, mm -hmm. of this throne room, right? Mm -hmm. And these interesting creatures, the mm -hmm. four living creatures. Mm -hmm. Then we come up to this odd group called the uh, the 24 elders, right? And we when we look at their some of their attributes, you know, they're clothed in white robes. You know, they have gold crowns on their head and they s lay them down at the feet of Jesus, you know, at the, at, the, at the foot of the crown. And they sing this new song in, in chapter five. It says, you know, they're redeemed by the blood of, uh, by the blood of Jesus and they're taken out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So we know they're not just Jews. They're, they're, they come from all over the world. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and also, you, they're, they're kings and priests. So, so where have we heard that term before? Promises to the church and to Israel. The kings and priests. That Melchizedek, right? The Old mm. Testament. He's sure. both a king and a priest. The book of Hebrews hammers home. Jesus is both king and, and priest after the order of Melchizedek. Sure. So who else is king and priest? The church. That's us. Mm -hmm. huh. I mean, how can this be? Paul said, don't you know you're going to judge angels and all that kind of language, you know, kings and priests. So... They, they sing this song in, in, uh, in uh, Revelation 5. And, it, and what's really interesting is the... Uh, let's go there, because I, I just want to read this. Uh, Revelation 5. i got to go one more chapter. And again, I am in the New King James Version. And this, this scene is right before Jesus starts opening the scroll. So this is ahead of any of the tribulation events. No, no seals yet, no trumpets or, or bulls. And, and here it is in uh, Revelation uh, 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. This is in the New King James Version. Yeah. What, which version are you reading? It's this is this is a pretty hefty debate on this. The, yes, it well, is. Yeah. Granted, the 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 uh, the uh, this is the King James version translation. Say putting it in first uh, person. There are translations because the, the ESV, the, ESV and the, or the NIV, NIV is going to say you them. ransomed people for God. You made them a kingdom and priests yeah. to our God. They put it into third person. I don't think that still dispels the idea that the church is there. So I think it's an unfortunate translation. And, and when I looked into that a little bit, I know you're, you're chomping here. I'm Give me just one more I, am, I, am, <laughs> I can I'm see a, you squirming. I am a patient <laughs> listener and learner and That's lover so of my brethren. But uh, <laughs> the way I understand it, and I, I, there were 20-some ancient manuscripts that we get our scriptures from. And only one of them translated into the third person. Hmm. The others, uh, you know, the King James Version went to a first person here. And again, I don't think it's necessary that it be in first person to say the church was already there. But, it, but it's interesting if it's true. And I, ha I haven't read these ancient manuscripts, but, uh, you know, fairly reliable source on, on the research that I've done. Only one of them translated it into third person. And so... Room for debate, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. yes. But that's the, uh, that's the reason why I believe that it's a pre-tribulation rapture because of all these reasons I just gave and the church is yeah. already there and all that. So I know there's holes in this. In there's all of our views. In all of the views. There and is. I'm sure Ryan's going to do a great job of pointing out <laughs> where these holes are in my view, right? So no. I, I gave the floor, right? It's all yours, man. No, bud. I just want to dialogue with it. So I would say, okay. so summer, I want to practice good active listening to you. So my, my summarization of your view, raised on millennial, Lutheran, uh, when, you, when you decided to study it for yourself and learn there was more literal hermeneutic approaches, 
Um, and then in, in stitching it together, you found Daniel 9 very compelling, the 490-year yep. yes. prophecy, For sure. with a marker of 483 years being a possible timeline fulfillment from Artaxerxes to Jesus' to, to Jesus's triumphal entry, yeah. which then would leave a seven years yeah. left. And so where does that go? Like, If it's 483 years to the event that the prophecy describes, which it describes an atoning for sin yep. and all this sort of thing, and that prophecy feels like there's parts that have been fulfilled and parts still to be fulfilled. So you go, okay, Artaxerxes to Jesus, triumphal entry is 483 years. The 62, seven things interesting because there's a, there's like a, there's a seven weeks, yep. there's a seven weeks, then a 62, uh, 62 weeks that comprises the 69 weeks. Sure. So that is interesting. What is that? Is that them initially coming back to? There's different conjectures. On right. That. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with that. Cause what I'll say is my view um, doesn't dismiss the potential of this, but I am um, not willing to build my, I'm not willing to put a lot of credence on the 70 weeks as framing the discussion unduly. I agree with you. As far as uh, timing, as, as far timing. as timing okay. and a literal seven year tribulation yeah, yeah. and a rapture that must precede it for that final 70th week to occur. Yeah. And the reason I feel that way is that you have 360 days in a year or 365. You have, do you start at Artaxerxes or do you start at Cyrus or do you start at Ezra when they, yeah, there's know, a whole study on there that. is, and there's a whole, yeah. there's books written on it yes. and there are brilliant scholars that they disagree. Yeah. And so is in my opinion, um, it is fascinating and I hold it open handed. It'd be wonderful. Uh, I have no, first of all, let me say this about your view. I, there's nothing about that, that if everything in, in the way you describe it occurs, yeah. I'm like, praise God. Okay. Let's go. Like, like rapture me tomorrow. Let's get it. <laughs> I'll explain it to you on the way up. Yeah, I am totally <laughs> fine with it. Now I'm not personally persuaded that that interpretation is the strongest. Okay. So, so for me, Daniel's 70th week, doesn't have to happen at the end of the age. I think the 490 years um, can take us to Christ where he atones for sin and accomplishes these things. And that that enables then the conversation about the tribulation in the end, which I think there is one, yeah. not having to be this fulfillment of the 70th seven. And it also means this isn't just about Jacob's trouble. This is about a world trouble of which Jews and Christians both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and then the third group would be pagans, non-believers, uh, will find themselves all walking through. So for me, we we have a lot of agreement on um, the view and order of the millennium, but the reason why we see the timing of the rapture slightly different is my view on Israel and the church and that, that composition, that relationship, and my view on the, the rapture itself uh, is not, I think, I don't want to say this very charitably, and, and uh, it's not trying to work off of the schema of the 70th week. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why. Now, if you go with that, uh, there has to be a, a seven, a literal seven year segment left. I see how it sets the trajectory. The other scripture verses that you used, um, I'll kind of just talk through. So, to me, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, yep, at, at the, the trumpet call of God, the voice of the archangel, the great shout, the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain are caught up together with him and will be with the Lord forever in the air. That, I think, is the definitive rapture verse. And I also think 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 54 is the other, where Paul says, not everyone will die, yeah, yeah. but everyone will be changed right. in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so that appears to me that that has to happen. Um, and I cherish and look forward to that promise. I just think that the return of Christ is an indivisible event and you have it split. You need a secret return uh, of Christ, which is just not visible to the world, that one day at any moment, boom, that translation, that catching up occurs. And then Jacob's trouble can commence. For me, I think that the rapture event is synonymous with the appearance of Christ, the parousia, the second. arrival, the second coming. And I get that because when I read Matthew 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, yep. Jesus talking about the birth pangs that will come. He's asked, what will be the sign of the times that you're restoring the kingdom? He talks about the birth pangs, famine, earthquakes, and war. Right. Those will all happen, but these are not the signs. Jesus pivots to the abomination that causes desolation. Yep. 
which is the Antichrist. And even if you have a way of reading that partially preteristic, which just means you see it as already fulfilled in AD 70, which post-millennialists do, I think it's a recapitulating prophecy, much like much of prophetic literature. It happens and happens again in a fullness of, of, of ways. So yep. Jesus did look at Jerusalem and say, this city is going to get ransacked. And I think yes. you, you read, I read that, that. And I think yep. it's going to happen again. I think it's going to happen again. So I think it's a near-term and far-term fulfillment that occurs with that. But when I read Jesus in Matthew 24, he doesn't seem to separate. <laughs> and so I feel like the inference that's on the pre-tribulationist is pushed onto the text from the outside, not heretically, but by basis of schema, that we have to say, well, in the same section of teaching, Jesus is saying this, and that's referring to his second coming, but this part's referring to his secret coming or the rapture. And so I think for my story, just to kind of like catch people up, I was trained yeah. the way you described. Yeah. And I actually shifted my view, not outside of premillennialism, which I'll get to in a moment, which is kind of one of my linchpin arguments for my view, but it's because um, I started to see that the simpler I felt like interpretively more straightforward approach to these words of Jesus in Matthew 24, which is him teaching the disciples about the end of things. Mark 13 echoes that from Mark. Yeah. Luke 21 echoes that from Luke. Um, we don't get it from John. And then when I read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, this is clearly a promised event, but I just don't see why this would happen separate from the revelation and manifestation of Christ to all nations in him coming on the clouds in his power and glory. There's nothing in 1 Thessalonians 4 that says this happened seven years earlier. And, and you would admit that. There's nothing there. It doesn't mean it can't, but there's nothing right. in 1 Thessalonians 4 that says this is going to happen here, and then this is going to happen there. And there's nothing in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, I would say, Sean, you still with us? Yeah, I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, to the contrary, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 talk about the resurrection of the dead. First, and Paul's concern to 1 Corinthians 15 is this gospel, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead then we are preaching futilely and you're still dead in your sins. Right. So the subject matter is resurrection. And it was the same in 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul's telling the church in Thessalonica, you're worried about if the people who've died before you that you love will somehow be at the day of the Lord and you won't, or you'll be at the day of the Lord and they won't is actually what was going on. You'll meet the Lord because we think he's coming soon, but they won't because they died. Right. And Paul says, no, 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 no. They will, you will by no means go ahead of them. They'll be raised to life. So... One of the things I would say is when I read, and we're going to get here, I'll take you to my, my uh, section yep. of scripture, Revelation 20. Go to Revelation chapter 20 with me, which is the millennium conversation where you and I see this the same way. But the real challenge that I have is starting in, uh, we'll just pick it up in verse 4. This is, I think, a connected vision to chapter 19. Jesus returns on the, returns on the great white horse. Um, uh, are you in the uh, NIV? I'm in the I'm in the ESV. But okay, ESV. Okay. He he wipes out the enemies that surround Israel. Um, and because because here's the deal, I still think Israel is important. Okay. That's where we're, I I'm not saying I'm not an all millennialist who would say there God has no future promises yet to fulfill for the ethnic people. Right. I think He does, but I think the church will always be these eternal, true Israel, one people of God. And so what he's wrapping up with national ethnic Israel is associated with the promises he's made that will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom that we'll, we'll talk yeah. about. End of Ezekiel and those yeah, passages. Yeah, right? exactly. So for me, I look at it and say, okay, then I saw thrones, verse 4, seated on them were those to whom authority was, uh, to judge was committed. I saw souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So the rest of the dead are 
throughout, in my opinion, I wouldn't say this is just through the tribulation. The dead of all history all will time. not be raised I would say, until yeah, the end. I, I'm with you on that. So then this phrasing, they came to life and reign with Christ, is referring to what? Well, I think he tells us. He says right here at uh, chapter 20, verse 5, section B, this is the first resurrection. The first resurrection. And so now we got to ask this question. Well, wait a minute. There's a resurrection? What is that resurrection? So what I do, and I think post-tribulational premillennialists do, or classic historic premillennialists, they just say, the resurrection of the dead, faithful dead, happens when? At the event where Christ returns, wipes out the enemies of Israel, because God is going to do something in national Israel. And there, there is a revival of a lot of ethnic Jews into the realization of who Christ is through this great tribulation, and sure. many die. But the dead in the church, the people of God throughout all of history, true Israel, are resurrected. And anyone who's alive and left and makes it through the tribulation, yep. they are 1 Thessalonians <laughs> 4, translated up. Right. And 1 Corinthians 15, changed in the, in the flash of an eye. And then G, uh, this is the vision, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Yeah. Over such, the second death has no power, but they were priests of God. There it is again, and of Christ, and the reign with them for a thousand years. So Revelation 20 to me seems to indicate that the ordering is that Christ returns, and when he returns, he does a handful of things. He wipes out the enemies of Israel, which are in turn the enemies of God. He comes to vindicate Israel. Much of Israel has experienced great travail and pain through this tribulation. And here's, here's, the, here's my view. And so have many in the church. Because I think the church goes through the tribulation. Now, let me answer some of your points, which are good, good points. Does that mean the church is appointed to wrath? No. Um, was Israel appointed to wrath uh, in, in, in Egypt when God poured out his judgments in plagues on Egypt? No. They were there, and they were in the land of Goshen, and they were protected. So we have an interpretive move both in John's gospel and in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. When it's saying, I will keep you from the hour of trial, does that mean I will keep you, meaning I'll pull you out of the world? Or does that mean I'll protect you and preserve you in the hour of trial? From the wrath of God, right. not from the attack of Satan, which will right. bring martyrdom. So you would see those as a different set of believers who come to faith apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit, and they're a unique kind of martyr in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. That's how I think I think your view would that's, see that. That is, yeah. Yeah, and I would just go, I don't think that that's, that's there. So I will quote as well Dr. Michael Heiser, who doesn't even like eschatology, bless his soul, he's passed away, but he just says, at the end of the day, we all have holes in our views. You're either a splitter or a joiner. And your view is going to split the comings of Christ into a secret first rapture and then a final second appearing. And I'm going to be a joiner. I'm going to say there's the church is only raptured, the dead in Christ are only resurrected, and the manifestation of the glory of Christ and the defeat of Satan, the Antichrist, and his false prophet, this only occurs at the glorious second coming of Christ. And this is our blessed hope, that no matter how dark it gets, Christ is coming, and he will come to vanquish his enemies, and he will come to raise the righteous dead, and he will come to translate those who are alive and remain. Um, and then we will reign with him for a thousand years uh, on this earth, and that's where you and I are very synced up as premillennials. So can, can I just time out just for a sec? So, yep. so back to uh, just a question on just a follow-up uh, on, on uh, chapter 20. This is the first resurrection yep. uh, after the... Could it be that this is... The first, uh, first resurrection as well as the other one? They're both part of the first resurrection? I mean, you I mean, would... Depending you would, on how you want to read You that, would right? have to say that to get your model to work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and you can do that. I just don't think... Here would be my big um, takeaway for where we differ. And I have total respect for you. And mo most of the church I think that I'm pastoring agrees with you. I think. We'll I, find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Well, it's the, it's been the, and this would lead me to some of the discussion. I don't know how much time we have left, but this would lead me to some of the discussion on history helping us here. I want to start with the text because I don't want to just use history, but essentially um, the predominant view in America presently is dispensational premillennialism. 
And I think well, this is largely there's, owed there's to... There's a lot of Amil guys out there yeah. in the denominational churches, for yep. sure. And the Catholic Church. And the Catholic, yes. For sure. But I still think, at least in evangelicalism, for, yes. it is the dominant view. Yep. And I think this is largely owed to Plymouth Brethren, Irish Revival, J.A. Darby, people not realizing that this way of looking at end times, and I'm not trying to use this to delegitimize it, only was popularized and made significant 150 years ago. Yeah. And there are certain people who want to defend pre-tribulationism and say, no, it's been around early church. But again, from the reading I've done on the historical record, the early church fathers were in vast majority futurists. Amen. You and I are like, yep. They were premillennial. Amen. And they're pre-tribulational. I know you've listened to some Chuck Missler stuff, and he's going to say that there was some pre-tribulational folks there too. The stuff I've read both shows the vast majority, they were, they were post-tribulational pre-millennialists. Whatever. We're not historians. Right. We're at the yeah. mercy of people telling us how old certain views are or whatever. But my understanding that helps me frame why I hold this view is that this is the oldest view in the church. This is a view in my mind that harmonizes instead of secretizes, not syncretizes, secretizes, almost like, well, that's not, you know. So that the, the odd part for me is while you're interested in indefinite literal hermeneutics, I feel like parts of this view have to approach this very mysteriously. And I want to simplify that, I suppose. I want to unify and simplify the interpretations where I feel like it gets rather complex on, on the pre-tribulational side. Um, I also think the idea the church isn't in Revelation is a tough question to wrestle with. They're addressed in chapters two and three. But saints and the elect are mentioned over and over, yeah. chapters five and four, or and four, six and four. That's where I'd say different. Yep. So we got to figure group. out who are who are those. I would say that's the church. Yeah, but see the church. Yeah. Okay. It, in my, it's just not mentioned. But the saints there. and the elect are. The, 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 it, but it's a different group. But that's so a, that, that's an inference. Yes. I, I think the question is why is that a different group? It's only needing to be a different group if we trace all the way back to. And this is just highlighting the difference of the views. Well, why would why wouldn't then in uh, where's the hundred forty four thousand? Is that uh, four, right? Dear Revelation four, seven. Four, oh, se seven. Okay. Revelation chapter seven. Yeah. So so this group of hundred forty four thousand that are that are sealed mm -hmm. specifically says that. Yeah. And, and uh, in fact, one angel says to the other angels, "Don't pour out your bold or your judgments yet. We got to seal these guys up." Yep. And then in the next following verses, it lists them specifically that yep. it's that it's. Jews from the uh, twelve thousand from each of the. You want to hear tribes. something interesting about but that? But then, but but nowhere in there you'd think if God was going to seal up the church there, why isn't it mentioned? Well, the there's the not great, a little note that says, "Oh, by the way, the church is." Sealed yeah, but the too. great multitude is the next thing in verse nine. After this, I looked, behold, a great multitude no one could number from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So you're going to say where, where, yeah. no. that's I'm verse sorry. 9 of chapter oh, nine. 7. Okay. So this gets down to how do you read? Yeah, because that would be all those that came to faith. Before, and they're in heaven around the throne. Yeah, after, after the rapture. I mean, right. you think of that, all these people disappear in yeah. the rapture. I mean, so, wow, there's going to be a lot of people. Some interesting notes for our listeners and, yeah, yeah. and people tuning in. Notice this. This is interesting. Do you notice the 12 tribes listed there are a listing of the 12 tribes nowhere else utilized in the entire Bible? It's missing. Yeah, I know. It's missing some of the tribes. Yeah. Like Dan's not there. Yes. But Dan is prophesied to have an allotment with the people of Israel. So why is the tribe of Dan not in that listing? Of, so so now this gets, yeah, so this gets into where people are debating this section of scripture. So the question becomes, are these 12,000 people sealed from each tribe? literally just about the literal Jewish nation? Or do we have, and this is where you're right, on hermeneutics, you move towards the symbolic side. Yeah. So I would just say those aren't actually the 12 literal tribes. So that's an interesting question. And I would say Revelation is filled with non-chronological, non-linear uh, sequencing of visions, which we can show in multiple places if we want. Revelation chapter 12 is a vision of a dragon and a, and a woman and a baby that is going back to the beginning of things, right. all the way to the end of things. Yeah. And so the way I think I view Revelation as a whole, which a, 
a, a dispensational pre-millennial pre-tribulationist would read it much more chronologically as you were saying the first three chapters of the church church raptured out see they're in heaven now the rest of this is for israel and then we don't come up back till the end so you read it very chronologically and and left to right what i would just say is i don't think the book presents the demand or the authorial intent to be read as such and so that is a hermeneutic difference which gives me I don't mean like the the license in a liberal sense. It gives me the the way of interpreting to go, okay, I think these are different visions that John is having. An analogy I like to use is like you went to the movie theater and every time an angel goes, come into movie theater one yep. and he sits down and he sees weird stuff. He sees a, a, a vision of the throne room and then he sees a, a, an angel that's so big that they have a foot on the land and the foot yep. in the water. And yep. I'm like... I can't be literal. Like there's a bunch of things he sees. He sees these plagues and these seals broken and and he sees he sees a lamb with like a bunch of eyes on it. He sees yeah. creatures. He sees all sorts of things that I'm not convinced are meant to be taken literal in themselves. They are speaking to literal truth, literal prophecy, literal yeah. promise. And like we said earlier, it, it you know there are things we are to take literally. Yes. And, and some of this stuff, we just don't know. Yeah. And and again, back to that passage in, in Daniel 12, God's going to reveal things. Like mm-hmm. like Daniel was freaking out, right? Wondering what all this stuff meant. Yep. And God tells him, go your own way, Daniel. Seal up the book. It's not for you. It's for people at the end. Yep. And so I think God will open up scripture to us and, and reveal some of this stuff in the proper time. Mm-hmm. And then some of us will probably have to change our views a little. Yeah. And some of us maybe not. Well, yeah. <laughs> if, if we get raptured up tomorrow, I'm going to be changing my view. Yeah, you will. So, pro- and it, maybe for we you. We just can't know. God will reveal it totally. in the proper time. But if you saw the Antichrist and we're still here, you'd probably be like... I'd say I'd change my view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, so, I don't think we'll have to do that. Yeah. But, so I guess for me, let me just end with uh, this. One of the reasons, too, that this, I think, does matter, because people might at this point hear us talk and go, well, Ryan seems to be convinced that Revelation 20 lays out an ordering of events that's pretty plain enough that seems to favor his view. Wayne's laying out Daniel chapter 9, and that seems pretty plain enough. That seems to favor his view as long as those dates all align. We agree that Christians aren't destined to wrath. God could preserve or pull out. There's a bunch of different ways to look at all that. One of the reasons, though, that does motivate me as a pastor for my view, and I think it probably was part of my view shift, was I don't want to misprepare the church. Yeah. And so from one a of, pastoral perspective, yeah, for you me, have to have application and all of those things. How, how do we apply this to our lives? Right. Because I just try to look at it and go, it, maybe we will be raptured out early. I don't think that's the strongest inclination I would take from the interpretations of the text. But I don't want to misprepare the church that we may have to endure the greatest hour of trial. And God will, I believe this, I don't. I, I take Revelation 3 seriously. Jesus will keep us from that hour of trial. Or even as this is another, I don't recall the exact reference, but for the sake of the elect, this is in his Olivet Discourse, oh, yeah, yeah. he'll cut the day short. Right. For me, I think a lot of that that language doesn't have to mean escape or 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 raptured out of it's that god is going to govern protect and this becomes an interpretive decision and there's there's debate on the actual language and the words much like we had with kingdom of priests they are kingdom and priests or kings and priests or those actual elders are saying um uh they are the redeemed in in my view to answer that i think those 24 elders are some sort of the heavenly council heiser talks about Mm -hmm. i think these are a part of God's divine counsel. They've always been there worshiping him in eternity past. And that's why I think in the NIV and ESV, they're not they're not saying that, you know, that this is us. You haven't ransomed and redeemed us. You've redeemed a people for yourself. They're taken out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Those people, yes, mm-hmm. the kings and priests. Yes. So it just becomes a possessive question. Is that those 24 or are those 24 singing about the multitude? Yeah. That's the question. Yes, okay. And yep. what the manuscripts are going to wrestle with that. Yes. I'm just saying to, to have a cohesion in the view, I, I look at it as Jesus is clearly addressing the church, chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation. In chapter 4, John sees a vision of the throne room, which is about worshiping the Almighty yep. in the face of everything. The, the elders that are represented there, I think, are part of the heavenly council. Some even surmise they're symbolically representing 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles of the church. That's actually John Piper's view who is also a historic premillennialist. Yeah. So that that take is to say they're they're singing about 
the redeeming action of God. And look at what he's done, the people he's made for himself. Chapter five introduces the slain lamb who's going to start to break the seals on the scroll, yeah. which is written on inside and out, which is basically... Legal who, document. Yeah, who has the authority to adjudicate the end of the age? Christ does. And he is breaking those seals. Now, my take on that is just those seals are a part of the birth pangs Jesus references in Matthew 24, earthquakes, famines, war, because that's what they are. The four horsemen are there. We know what they are. They're war, they're famine, they're pestilence. So we see that going on. And then, yes, at some point, this cycle of seven seals, which turn into seven trumpets, turn into seven bowls, accelerates the intensity of the tribulation and God's wrath is poured out. I think that there's, because I don't think there's clear indication the church is raptured. I think that's an inference you could take, but it's not clearly taught. I don't make the interpretive move that we're gone. Therefore, referring to the saints and the elect as us, we're protected from the wrath of God, but we're susceptible to the attacks of Satan, and we live and testify to the gloriousness of the gospel through the great hour of travail. And yes, he's keeping us from the wrath of God, but we're also serving the function of bearing witness to the greatness of Christ. And that, that leads me to, to the end, where when Christ returns, I can read Revelation 19 and 20 very straightforward. It's Christ comes, obliterates his enemies. Yeah. He raises the dead in Christ. The, the, those who are alive and remain are translated, new bodies. We rule and reign with him for a thousand years in the, in the millennial kingdom. That, that, that passage kind of blows my mind too. How can people rebel when Jesus is actually on earth ruling? Hmm. Yeah. And re, how, how does that It's a mystery for happen? us. And to be fair to our critics who aren't in the room, because yeah. we're both premillennial, right. they're going to look at us and say, you guys got some challenging holes because you guys, there's some final rebellion a thousand years later. Right. Who is that? Yeah. Who are these people? Yeah. What is happening during this actual thousand years on earth where to fulfill the Ezekiel 40 through 48 stuff, there's a new, there's a new, there's a temple. There's all these fulfillments. Jesus is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem and the church, yeah. Jew and Gentile. Yeah. I will say the one people of God, even at that point, I think you would say whether it's Israel and the church at that point are... We are, they're one entity yeah. with, with Christ ruling and reigning. Yeah. So yeah, that's challenging. But, but the, the, if I read that Revelation 20 straightforward, it's like there's a thousand year reign. And at the end of that, Satan is loosed because he was bound in a pit in the first three verses and he's loosed to deceive the nations. And then there's a final wipeout. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the hordes of people as if the sands of the sea, you know, it's like a lot of people. Yeah. So that is, we have to say, and that's where like for an all millennial or a post-millennial, they can look at those different because they don't think that thousand years yeah, yeah. is as we see it. So mm. it's probably been a crash course for people. Oof. I think it's a super challenging, how much time we got left? We got three minutes. Three minutes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll, we'll just sum it up this way, Wayne. Yeah. We want people to have a view, hold the view. We want them to be hungry yeah, to sure. engage with this, but also hold stay in humility. Yes. Because well said. We could be right. We could be off a little. I'm sure all of us are off at least a little. Yes. Me included. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Any other thoughts on it? No, no. It's been a it's been a great discussion. Again, I appreciate being here. It was it was very fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. Sean, what would you say in our last minute? Because you basically, I feel like you might feel like you just sat there and listened to Wayne and I just go on and on. If, you're, if you're a visual learner, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We, yeah, had one, we had one chart. <laughs> we had one chart. We had one chart. You know, there, there are many views here, uh, and it can, it, again, these are models. We've talked about this before on the podcast, like man-made models that, that yep. we have put into, into a box. And so it can become this feeling um, of like, I don't understand this. I got to get to the bottom of this. Again, we said at the very beginning of Revelation, the point of this isn't to somehow take all these symbols and put them together and like, we got the answer. Um, I think the encouraging news is like, Jesus is returning. Mm -hmm. and, and how are you going to live until he comes? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the name of our series, mm -hmm. right. right? And so I think all three of us, um, no matter our opinion on that, we look at that, we have tremendous hope. And we, we yeah, we take... Which team are you on now? Which... which, which... Oh, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, you know, Wayne has more gray hairs than you. I um, know, he's got he, much more as wisdom. As far as hours put in on this very subject, um, he, he might... He might win the battle. Um, no, I think what's what's interesting is you. I think for me, growing up in a in a church that we're a huge fan of the um, movie. Um, 
Left Behind. Left Behind. Thank oh, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I remember I told Ryan this last week. He goes, what do you think? He goes, well, I, I remember growing up and thinking like, mom, like we need to keep extra cat food and dog food in the house <laughs> because if we're gone, like how are the animals going to survive? Right. Um, but I don't think we should be afraid. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm, what I'm sensing is we shouldn't be afraid of Christ's return. Um, and so whether or not he has us here to endure through, through the suffering of a tribulation or not, um, I know that whatever path uh, God is going to sustain and protect what us. What are some books, Wayne, maybe? Because I, I, I can think of two books I'd recommend. Do you have some people could read to further explore the view of dispensational pre-tribulationism? Well, depending on how deep they want to read, like Tommy Ice, okay. he has a website called Pre-Trib Institute or something like that. He's okay. he's like the pre-trib guy. He's okay. the hyzer yeah. you know, of, of the, the pre-trib view. Okay. Him. There, there's some easier reads. Dr. David Reagan uh, talks about this. He had a TV show called uh, Christ in Prophecy or something mm -hmm. like that. He, he has a fascinating book on the history of Israel, the past, present, and future. Okay. Really fascinating book. And you had and, me read and, a book. Yeah. Uh, uh, John MacArthur's John, book. What is it called uh, again? I uh, forget. What's the name of that one? The Time is Short or something, yeah. something like that. John Be MacArthur has a book, and he is a pre-tribulational, yeah. pre-millennial. Yeah. It's, a very you know, intelligent Bible teacher. There, there's tons of resources yeah. out there for these. For the these two things. I would say that were helpful for me because again, I was, you know, raised in and instructed in a dispensational pre-tribulation view. Um, the two I would say is uh, Craig Keener and Dr. Michael Brown's book called We're Not Afraid of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That is a classic or historic premillennial book. The other one that I actually just read in preparation for this podcast yeah is George Ladd. George Ladd has a book called The Blessed Hope. Um, and it's about the second uh, coming of Christ and the rapture. And just kind of like helping differentiate the historic position of post-tribulationism from the, the much more popular and well-known pre-tribulation view. And it's charitable. It's, it's, it's a book, so it's defending the view I was trying to espouse. But it's also charitable. It ends wonderfully just saying, hey, we, we are much more aligned here than we are not. Yeah. And it's a good place for people to go for extra digging on the rapture. So I think it's like, don't be afraid, but don't also be disinterested. I think the hardest task I feel uh, uh, like I'm carrying right now for the next few months for True Hope is how I'm going to navigate us through Revelation in a way where people aren't like, who cares, man? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yawner. Yeah. And to just not think this is a subject for the nerds or the elders or, yeah. you know, the pastors. It's like... We want you to love scripture because scripture points us to Jesus and Jesus is coming. And we're not in love with the idea of utopia. We're in love with the person who will rule the kingdom to come and a new heavens and earth. And, and this book does offer that special blessing yes. that we talked about earlier. It's yes. the only book in the Bible that does that. Yeah. And part of that might be there, there's so much illusion from the Old Testament into Revelation. Oh, big time. If, if you're going to chase down everything in Revelation, you end up going through almost every book in the Bible. Amen. And Seriously. I love that. Yeah. And I think one of the things I'd say to people, we're going to end with this. I know we got to wrap the time, but like this is going to be a little bit of a pastoral punch. Not to you, okay. to, to, to Christians. If you loathe Revelation you might not have a deep love and grip on the rest of your Bible. Mm. Because Revelation is hard to read if you're very unaware and uninformed mm. about the nation of Israel and her history, the minor prophets, the major prophets, the words of Jesus, mm. the teaching of Daniel. You, you might be kind of biblically illiterate. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Well, I just, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a podcast with me unless there's a little bit of a push. Because I'm like, part of the reason the church is afraid of the book of Revelation, doesn't want to teach the book of Revelation, doesn't want to entertain it, is both because it's been so controversial, it can be mired in unnecessary hubris and arrogance and division. Yeah, true. But another reason no one wants to talk about is this. We are very biblically illiterate, so why would we study a book that would demand a level of engagement and some to some level full, fully informed on the canon of scripture. Mm. So it is both a task for the preacher, but it is a task for the parishioner. It is a call. Get your heart, the Bereans, yeah. get your heart in the scripture and you will see, I find, and Wayne and I talk about this a lot, the more you study this, 
you will probably become more persuaded of a view, but you will also become humble because mm-hmm. you'll go, Woo! Right. these are tough. <laughs> We've got to make interpretive hermeneutic decisions and do it as consistently as we can, but we, none of us have the fullness of light. And so, hey, we're going to walk in charity and in kindness and in trust mm. as we navigate it. So good. Yeah. Wayne, thank you for being here. You are thoroughly prepared, which I appreciate it. And awesome. uh, it's just contagious, even your uh, your passion for scripture and you just jumping around from book to book. And that is exciting. Something I aspire to be more like. Um, if you are listening and you enjoyed this episode, we have a few more special episodes coming out before yep. we wrap up Revelation. One of them is the Antichrist, Mark of the Beast. Mm-hmm. Pro- probably going to have to have Wayne back. Yeah, uh, um, Wayne might be the resident yeah, expert. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about, is America Babylon? Big question mark. Um, and then finally, um, just the millennium, which we, we hit on today. And so I think that episode will tie nicely. So these are episodes we will release over the next additional months months, um, in hope to uh, help the understanding of this what is a Mm -hmm. complicated book right so awesome thanks for joining us okay go in peace